actually here he is, a real person. Uh, our vice president, Don Leonard, is going to be doing his astrophotography society, or Columbus Astronomical Astrophotography Show and Tell. Okay, and these are uh, astrophotography done by the members and sent in. So, without further ado, Don. Thank you. As Jim said, I'm uh, the vice president, which is usually a pretty useless uh, title, but uh, one of my uh, pleasures is trying to figure out <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, one of my uh, privileges is to try to figure out what we get to talk about and uh, kumbaya about and our love of astronomy. And we've had a fabulous series on supernova with uh, professors from OSU uh, coming to talk to us about their cutting edge research. Uh, we've had presentations on advanced astrophotography. Um, I thought what would be nice is to just sort of crowdsource this one and see how everyone is approaching the recording of what we see above. So when I sent this out, uh, first of all, I had no idea what kind of response we were going to get. I was hoping for maybe at least a handful. Um, I think we have over 15, so I'm just super excited by the, uh, the response from you all. Um, they range in everything from me basically holding my smartphone up to uh, my eyepiece on my telescope. Uh, to some stuff that I think would give the Hubble Space Telescope a run for its money. Um, with that, um, I want to sort of tell you a little bit about my on-trained astrophotography, which was more from just taking pictures of landscapes. Um, I'm going to uh, kill this light here uh, so that we can all see the photos, because that's what we're really here for. Um, I took this photo. And I did it uh, in rural Maine, in sort of upstate Maine, along this river. I'm using a, a quite, not quite fisheye, but a quite wide angle lens, so it almost looks, makes the river look like a lake. Uh, but obviously it was in the middle of the summer when the uh, Milky Way galaxy was, uh, was shining brightly. And all this took was a typical consumer camera sitting on a tripod with a 30 second exposure, nothing more to it. Now, um, when I show you the photo I took on Thursday night, you, you'll probably think I should have stuck with this because it did not come out as well. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the tricks for our, our folks who are new to the club or new to astronomy or new to astrophotography at least, is that the sky moves. <laughs> And if you have a, a camera that's standing still and a sky that's moving, guess what would normally happen over a 30 second exposure? You'd start seeing the scar stars turning into streaks across the sky. Now there's this funny little quirk, the wider angle your lens, the longer your exposure can be before the stars start streaking, which is why I was able to get away with, uh, for this shot, just putting a camera on top of a tripod, setting it for a 30 second exposure, and pressing the go button. You know, there were no filters, there was some editing in, in Photoshop or whatever, but it was a pretty easy shot to take. Uh, on Thursday, I went down to JGAP. There we go. Ta-da! Um, that's me at JGAP. Um, and I took this, which is the Beehive Cluster, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, several things went wrong here. The first one was, by now I've kitted up, I've got a, uh, a telescope, it's on a mount, the mount has a motor on it, so it should be able to track, and yet I forgot to verify that the battery pack for the, um, for the mount had actually been charged. So my mount didn't track. Now, JGAP does have electrical outlets in the main observing area. So had I brought my backup of an AC power thing, I still could have bailed myself out and maybe uh, been able to capture a, a better image of a, of a more exotic deep sky object like the ones, some of the ones you'll see tonight. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't 
plan for either of those contingencies. So what I did is I pulled up the Sky Safari uh, thing on my, on my device, and I just asked it to sort deep sky objects by magnitude to find the brightest thing in the sky, hoping that I could get away with something like this, which was just a one second exposure, right? So, um, so that happened. Uh, it was, I was so excited because on May 11th, looking at the forecast, it was one of the clearest nights, both in terms of cloudlessness, but also some of the stuff that happens in the upper atmosphere, like less humidity in the air, less atmospheric turbulence. There are actually three things that need to come together for really exceptional viewing in astrophotography. All things were in alignment, except I didn't have my battery. So uh, I'll be kicking myself on that until the next time and never make that mistake again. Uh, but getting, again, I want to just emphasize, you know, this was taken with a smartphone. Um, I had a doohickey to attach it to my eyepiece. I was sort of fussing with it a little bit, but I got it to work. Um, so it does not take a, uh, a professional astrophotography rig uh, to get into it, right? Um, so that's sort of a, uh, I'm going to own the uh, low bar here and vote myself uh, Mr. Congeniality for astrophotography for the night. <laughs> Um, something a little bit more impressive, I think. Uh, Mark, if you want to come up here and uh, talk about your comet shot. Let's see here. And we'll just uh, pass this mic around as we go and uh, hear from the photographers and what they uh, captured, why they decided to capture it, and what they used to do it. I don't think I need the microphone. Oh, it's for the recording, yeah, I think. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I submitted this one because it was a very simple setup. Um, this one did have a, a mount that was um, compensating for the rotation of the Earth. So it wasn't that the sky was moving, it was the Earth moving. <laughs> uh, just, just in case uh, that was unclear to someone. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, this is, so this is the, the Pleiades, the seven sisters. And uh, the comet was, I think, um, it was within five degrees of the star cluster. And um, I had a simple ioptron mount that I bought used for $200. And it runs on like eight AA batteries, and I did have uh, batteries, and uh, so it was working. Um, I had a wide angle lens, and that, that's what I was going to use to shoot it. Um, but I wanted to get in a little closer, and Broad generously loaned me his uh, 130 millimeter, I think it was, um, 135, sorry, Rokinon lens which um, it was a fixed lens, uh, not, a, not, a, not a zoom, so, um, thank you. So it, it's, um, but it's, it's a very fast lens, and that's what you want. You want a lens that's gonna um, let in a lot of light very quickly so you can take short exposures. So this was uh, one 15 second exposure, a single one, uh, slightly processed in Photoshop. The hard, the only hard part about this photo is getting a good focus. And so that, you know, that takes a little bit of fussing with. Um, but then, you know, the ioptron, even, at, even with a longer lens, it's not a very sophisticated mount, uh, but even with a longer lens, you can get, um, uh, you know, stars that are not trailing at 135 millimeters. Um, basically, the longer the lens you use, um, the more difficult it becomes, and the more, uh, uh, the better your tracking has to be. If you use a wide angle, really wide angle lens, it's very forgiving. So this one was a little bit less forgiving, but still not, not too bad. So I actually took, um, I don't know, I think, I think I have like 20 minutes actually uh, 
of shots. You know, I took a whole bunch of 15 second shots and um, I just never got around to stacking them. So I still have them. <laughs> and uh, so if I would actually align and, and stack the photos, uh, I would have, you know, a, I'd see a lot more nebulosity in the Pleiades. You can, you can see just a little, a little bit around, uh, let's see, what, what star is that broad? That one is uh, Moroni. Yes, the, and this is the, the Moroni Nebula here. Um, and you know, you can see it a little bit. I think uh, Brad has a similar shot from the same night, and this was taken on the lawn of Perkins Observatory, I think after a meeting. Yeah. And um, so he's got one where he did stack and has, you know, a whole bunch more blue nebulosity in the Pleiades and probably more green in the comet. But I like this one because this one looked very similar to what I saw in my binoculars. And so I, 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 I just never bothered processing all the photos and I just enjoyed this. I think I did dark frame subtraction maybe, um, but that's about it. And uh, that's about it. Just one comment, you, you mentioned that uh, it's hard to get focused. If with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, if you go to live view or anything, mm -hmm. and you go most of them, you go like 10 times magnification, it's actually easy compared to some other systems to get a focus. Can you find just some faint star, and when it's in focus, you'll see it's slightly out of focus, it just goes away. So if you focus 10x in live view, it's Pretty good. Yeah, I think if you if you master that and you and you do have the live view, and I can't remember at the time. Um, I th yeah, I, th I probably did. It's 2018. It's, yeah, I probably did. Um, yeah, if you if you master that, it's still probably the hardest part of this uh, is is the getting the the good focus. It's not just infinity. Not infinity. Not infinity. Um, that's a good starting. That's a good starting place. Uh. <laughs> that, that picture is kind of very focused. Yeah. 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 Now, putting the backyard in backyard astronomy, we have uh, Charles here with, uh, with Venus. I don't know if uh, Charles here, you want to say anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was my favorite part, was uh, he started a fire in the chimney and roasted some hot dogs in it thus making me uh, sad that I wasn't invited over for the Venus uh, setting party. Uh, those look pretty good. Um, yeah, you can do it anywhere. Uh, one of the things that surprised me, and th this shot made me think of it, when I first started this hobby about two years ago, I thought you had to be dark, dark sky for everything, and I thought you had to pack up and go 30 minutes out of town, either up here to Perkins or down to J Gap, somewhere like that. The beautiful thing is for some of our solar objects like the Moon and uh, Saturn and Jupiter, you can get a lot of the ooh-ah within city limits, you know, because they're so bright, because they're so close. Um, so really expanding our imagination about what counts as astrophotography um, and thinking about ways in which the, uh, the solar stuff like the Moon and planets uh, are a lot more forgiving, I think, to uh, uh, to both viewing and to astrophotography than, um, well, especially to viewing, I think, than I th was obvious to me when I started this hobby. Um, next up, we have John with uh, some front yard astrophotography. <laughs> Is John here? Going to come up? All right. I will uh, read what John sent me. Um, 
He said, first I stacked the pictures as layers in Photoshop and merged with the light and blend mode. Wow, it took hours for Photoshop to process. And the program was so bogged down that you couldn't really do any other work, like layer masking. On the other hand, Star Stacks only takes a few minutes and will also generate a neat cumulative time-lapse movie. But it requires JPEGs, and there's no way to mask the two bright areas on the porch. So I broke the image set into groups where foreground lighting was constant and was able to pass only a dozen or so pictures to Photoshop where I could use layer masking to manage the porch lighting. I'm still not really happy with the way the house lighting looks, but it's a learning experience. I have a lot more to experience with cooled monochrome, CCD, and CMOS astrophotography, so it's been fun to rediscover my DSLR, his camera, uh, for night photography there. Uh, so again, if you, for those of you who can't read, um, this is, uh, and for those of you who may not know the sort of the mechanics of this, uh, if you point at the, the North Star towards the pole there and have these types of uh, time-lapse uh, sequential exposures, that's how you create these star trail effects. So um, these are 450 one-minute exposures uh, with about two seconds in between uh, each exposure in order to create this effect. And he used what's called an intervalometer in order to do it, if memory serves. Uh, 10 millimeter lens on, I think the 60D is a crop sensor, like an APS-C. So that's about 15 millimeter and, and uh, 35 millimeter equivalent. So a quite wide angle lens there to fit it all in. Uh, but just a, a real impressive shot, I thought. Uh, next up, we got uh, Phil Creed. Is Phil here? All right. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll sort of go over uh, Phil's stuff here. Um, Phil's using a very expensive telescope, uh, the Teleview uh, refractor, uh, with uh, what I assume must be also a pretty fancy camera riding on a, uh, uh, a tracking mount. 52 three-minute uh, exposures for a total of 2.6 hours of data that he collected. Uh, a Bortle 6 driveway, uh, for the uninitiated, that's a lot of light pollution, right? Uh, I think it's another reminder of some of the ways in which astrophotography can make up for some of the deficits we have uh, as, as city dwellers, um, both for astrophotography like you see here, but if you just want to use it to enhance your optical viewing experience through uh, what's called uh, electronically assisted astronomy, uh, just so many ways in which we can use this technology to absorb more light than our, our human eyes do at any given moment and really reveal the secrets of the cosmos, if you will. Uh, so he's using a filter here, an Optolong l Enhance filter. I don't know what l Enhance means. It's actually used for sort of narrowband, so it's got like four band passes. Okay. So it's a semi-narrowband filter, so it cuts out probably 80% of the visible light. So it's cutting some hydrogen, some oxygen? It's hydrogen, O3, probably S2. It's, it's not a real narrowband filter, but it still cuts out at least 80% of the broadband light, to, and it's mainly useful for nebulas. Yeah, so it's going to really increase the contrast here, the, the sort of difference between the uh, lightened portions and the darkened portions, creating the effect of appearing to make it a much brighter image, even though it's constricting the amount of light that's actually uh, passing through the optical instrument. I mean, I think that's a good point, the driveway. I mean, I can even image from Paul if I use narrowband filters like this. And I have similar setups where I use l hands or L-Extreme filters that filter out most of the skylight, most of the bright light. As long as you're shooting nebulas, works just about as well as shooting out in the country. Yeah, just really remarkable. So, uh, no excuses. <laughs> Um, if you can't get to that dark sky location uh, after work on a clear night. Uh, so uh, some other notes that uh, Phil left for us. This is uh, Able 21, a.k.a. Sharpless 2-274. And you haven't turned to, if you haven't turned to stone after seeing the picture, good, because this is often called the Medusa Nebula. It is a planetary nebula along the Gemini Canis Minor border, uh, just barely in the former. The object is very large, as seen from our earthly perspective, roughly one-third the width of the full moon. Lying 1,500 light-years away, Phil reminds us, 
The Medusa Nebula is a challenging visual object due to low surface brightness requiring a keen eye and dark skies. So you can, in a really dark sky location, try to identify its location, but boy, this uh, tech helps. Uh, again, shot with uh, the Teleview refractor, fancy camera, and filter. Uh, Ryan, I know Ryan's here. Come on up, Ryan. Show us what you uh, tell, share with us what you got. All right, so I took this in my backyard in Westerville, so it's like a Bortle 8. So really, <laughs> really, really, uh, luckily my, the northern part of the skies, I'm not shooting into light, uh, light dome, so it's really good. Uh, it's, I was running this on a William Optics Xenostar 73, it's 430 millimeters in focal length. It's a really good scope for this target because it pretty much fills up the whole frame. I'm using the ASI 2600 MC Pro. That's a one-shot color camera, APS-C size sensor. The filter that I use is the L Extreme. As uh, Tom had mentioned, it's it basically it's a dual narrow band filter. It only lets in hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. Filters out all the other light, which is really good in a high bordal zone. What I ended up processing everything in Pixinsight. And to get those blues to really pop, I created a color mask and just isolated the blues, increased the luminance, increased the saturation. I pulled the stars out using star exterminator and then re uh, reduced them so they're not as bright in the final image and recombined them back in after the fact. Uh, as far as acquisition, I use the ASIR Plus, running everything off of my iPad, which is really convenient because I think I took this in January, so you know how Ohio Januarys go <laughs> cold. Uh, so one of the good things about with the ASIR Plus is it's pretty much all automated except for polar alignment. And I bring my scope in and out uh, every time I do this. So I just go outside, polar line it within five minutes, go back inside, stay nice and toasty, let the autofocus routine run and just let it run. It does the meridian flip automatically. I set my alarm at four o'clock in the morning, get up, bring it in, go back to bed. That's what I really like about the software. Uh, any questions? Nope, okay. So let's try. Thank you. A good example of image processing. That's what makes the image, yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. what did the subs look like? I mean when, when you first got it off the camera. You can see the outer edge of the nebula. I do five minute exposures. Um, just because that's what I have my dark set at and I really don't want to feel like you're taking a whole new set of darts every time I go out. And what aberration was that? I'm sorry? What, what was the aberration again? What, what f stop? What, what was the focal length? 430. 400 and that was f. It's probably 5, 6, five, five. six something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are new to astrophotography, this is obviously a very uh, lingo-rich uh, hobby. Um, let that be a cautionary tale if you look up and say, oh, I want to make that. <laughs> be careful. Uh, it's a long rabbit hole, but uh, as you can see, uh, just a, a really rewarding one is se several of you who emailed in submissions commented just what remarkable results amateur astronomers can produce literally in their sometimes very urban backyards, as Ryan's example demonstrates. Just super, truly awe-inspiring, I think. Um, all right, Mark in. So, don't let anybody tell you you can't take pictures in downtown Columbus because this is from Old Town East, just near the 71 70 split, and I think we're in Bortal 11. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So there are, uh, I, 
think it goes from one to nine officially. Um, and if you're in Bortle One, um, it's very dark. And if you look up and you see a cloud, the cloud will be black. All right? And you'll be able to see the Milky Way and probably the, what they call the zodiacal light and um, other things that not many of us have seen before. When you get into Bortle 5 and 6, you're approaching sort of the outskirts of city, and you'll be able to see dome of light above the, above the uh, horizon. Um, and it really starts to sort of interfere with the, the level of detail that you can see in the night sky. By the time you get to like level Bortle 7 and Bortle 8, the sky is kind of, it's no longer dark. It's kind of got this sort of brown background to it. A, a lot of stars aren't uh, visible. And by the time you get to where I live, you know, I'm lucky that I can see the major constellations and I can see Polaris because one of the first things I do at night is go and polar align my scope. And if it was any more borderly than that, <laughs> I think I probably wouldn't be able to see Polaris either. So, so the higher a Bortle number you get, the, the, the less detail and less visibility of bright objects you have in the sky. So if you go to a, a really nice dark sky site, Bortle 2, Bortle 3, you'll probably be able to see all sorts of things that you've never seen before in your life. Anyway, um, this is taken from my backyard, um, and uh, it's M51, which was the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is about two and a half hours of acquisition. I did 90, 90 seconds because I thought that I would be able to get some detail in it, and I probably overdid the, uh, I probably overdid on the saturation. Um, I did enhance the colors in it a little bit to bring out some of the, the star forming regions in the galaxy. Um, but for a first attempt, um, it's pretty good. You have to realize this is an insanely big crop. I mean, this image is probably, if, if I had to put a percentage on width of the sensor, this is probably a 20th of the total width of my camera sensor. My camera sensor is only 300, or sorry, 3,000 pixels wide. So this is not a very big object. Um, and my focal length on this is about 480 millimeters. Um, if I went up to 1,500, 1,600, I'd probably have a much larger picture with a little bit more. Is just right for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm about four times smaller than I'd really like to be. Um, at any rate, I did it anyway. And uh, thanks for uh, taking a look at it. Do you guys have any, any questions about it? Nice job from the area you're in. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. Did you use any filter at all then? Uh, UVIR. UVIR. Yeah, that's it. I, I don't have any other filters at the moment, so I'm kind of using what I got. Good job. Let's see. Yeah, and, uh, Mark gave us uh, some detail on it. Uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy found in the constellation of Ursa Major hypothesized that it is a companion galaxy, its companion galaxy 5195, NGC 5195, passed through the main disk of M51 some 500 million years ago. And he reminds us that uh, um, NGC 5195, as we observe it now, is beyond M51. Um, so yeah, just really remarkable work there, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, that title tab is pretty, is pretty unique. Um, Mike Fritas, I can introduce your uh, photo and your cat if you're here. All right, so um, Mike is showing us uh, Cigar and Bodhi, two of my favorite uh, objects to look at through an eyepiece, as well as his cat Grace. Um, so uh, let's see, we've got a, uh, I think that's a refractor, the AT-115. 
uh, with a uh, focal length reducer. Um, he's got an imaging camera. He's got a, uh, is that the guides? The guide camera, is that what that's yeah. indicating? Okay. Uh, full field after integration and auto cropping. I don't know what either of those things mean. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I saw Jim posted something on uh, uh, the forums about it. He actually got two, uh, three deep sky objects there because now we've got cat eyes. Um, for those who are new to astronomy, um, I got to tell you, these two objects are so much fun to look at through the eyepiece. The fact that you can, without having to strain your imagination or your eyeballs too much, see two galaxies in the same eyepiece, um, this is definitely in my top five favorite uh, visual objects. Um, the first time I ever saw them, and back to this topic of Bortle, since I'm the MC, I'm just going to monopolize the fact that I have the microphone here and tell stories. Um, I don't even think I told you this, Jim. The first time, the reason I joined this club was because my wife and I were getting ready to go to uh, Big Bend National Park down on the Texas-Mexico border uh, for Christmas break. Uh, we're both teachers. And I was like, and I saw somewhere, I was like, oh, it's a dark sky preserve. Oh, uh, I, I used to want a telescope when I was a boy. And I thought, hmm, mom's not here to tell me I can't go buy a telescope. I, I might want to take a telescope with me to the national park, right? Um, well, the, the club was still under sort of quarantine at the time, so I, I did a lot of my research for the trip on, on websites like uh, cloudynights.com and came up with a list of objects like this that I thought would be encouraging. I got down to Big Bend, which is, I mean, it must be Bortle Point Zero One. It is so dark. I looked up at the night sky. I'm from Alaska. We have the Big Dipper and the North Star on our flag. I know how to find Ursa Major. I couldn't find it. There were so many stars that were all so bright. I was completely disoriented. Uh, I was emotionally and perceptually unprepared to see what a truly dark night sky looks at. I've been in, just so you guys know for comparison, uh, this last winter we went out to Death Valley National Park in California. Very dark, but I'm sorry, it's not the same Bortle one as, as Big Bend. You can still see a little bit of the light dome. It must be Vegas uh, up against the ridges when you're in that, in that valley in Death Valley, which is just to say Big Bend is, I can vouch for it, one of the places where it is at if you want dark, dark, prehistoric skies. I think the Texas Star Party is going on as we speak. In that area? <laughs> Don't leave this planet's surface until you've been there, folks. It is really special. Anyway, big fan of this object. As soon as I figured out how to uh, uh, get my go-to to point towards it in the middle of all the floating in the stars, it was, it was really special. Um, yeah, Roy, you were actually trying to image one of these uh, down at uh, JGAP. <laughs> that would have been a great follow-up, but you wouldn't show us your, your slop, so <laughs> we'll... Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Some things are just meant to be thrown away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you're doing a lot of good outreach work down there while you were try while you were imaging, so maybe that didn't uh, bode well. Uh, Isaac couldn't be here tonight, um, but I wanted to take us from uh, from two galaxies to, I mean, at least four. Uh, there may that may be a fifth one up in the top left. I I don't know. Um, but anyway, he used a telescope, he used a camera, eight five-minute images through luminescence, red, green, and blue filters. I'm assuming that means that the camera itself is monochrome, yes. and then yeah. the yeah. filters are adding color? You've seen a couple others that have the ASI cameras, and if they say MC, that's one-shot color, and MM is basically the same sensor, except it doesn't have the filters in front of it, so it's, it's monochrome, and you have to use a focal wheel. And then you use the filter wheel on the back end of it. On the back end, it's both. Yeah. yeah, before the camera. Or no. It's before the camera. Yeah. Before the camera, right. Um, total integration time of two hours and 40 minutes. Process with Pick Insight. Um, 
Isaac tells us, centered on NGC 3190, we can find this diverse collection of four galaxies in the constellation of Leo. At the top of the image is a fairly featureless galaxy, NGC 3193. Right below that is the showcase spiral galaxy, NGC 3190. Below that is NGC 3187, a striking bare, uh, barred spiral galaxy with a beautiful structure. And on the lower left is NGC 3185, a barred spiral galaxy with a distinctive outer ring. This group of galaxies is about 80 million light years distant. Um, images composed of only five, only eight five-minute images. Uh, so, by Isaac's terms, this was a quite minimalist uh, <laughs> deep sky observation. Well, what, that was taken here in Ohio, Northern Hills, only about 20 miles from here, so that's a pretty good. Other things, just for fair warning, that's a twenty thousand dollar scope on a fifteen thousand dollar mount and a six thousand dollar camera in many years of experience. Right. So, and you wonder why he's the uh, uh, in charge of the Cassis uh, yeah. Columbus astrophotography. Uh. This is not your snapshot with your phone <laughs> on your camera on your scope. That's right. That's right. Just stunning, though. Um, all right. And then uh, David Norris also sent one in. I, I'm friends with him on Facebook through uh, actually my day job as a city and regional planner uh, professor at Ohio State. Um, he when he's not astronomizing, he's also uh, fighting for social justice in our cities and regions. Um, but he's just a phenomenal astrophotographer. If you guys uh, don't already follow him, I highly suggest tracking him down on one of the social medias. Um, he's really excited. He just got this new carbon fiber tripod that's ultra light. He's got a uh, small little go-to and I think, uh, what, a little 50 millimeters, those red cats? Uh, just a real, you know, you know, like a big beer can, uh, kind of a telescope that produce, that are not terribly, not a $6,000 telescope, uh, the Red Cat, but can really, you know, given uh, good tracking and, and good technique and, and obviously a good camera, produce remarkable results as well. Um, yeah. He writes uh, uh, more sort of information about the Rosette Nebula in uh, Monoceros, just over Orion's shoulder. And you can kind of see Orion. Well, if you're standing where I am, you can see Orion uh, in the uh, shot he took of the shot. Uh, the nebula was shaped by the star cluster at its center, designated NGC 2244, which formed from the matter of the nebula. Uh, this was his first testing of his ultra-portable rig. His, he wrote to me, this is kind of the grab and go that um, he can put in his backyard, he can throw it in the car and haul down to J-Gap without uh, throwing his back out of alignment. So um, yeah, just uh, really remarkable there. The other thing that uh, uh, David sent me uh, was some daytime astrophotography of our favorite astro, the sun. Um, I sort of, to make this slide work, put his, uh, some of his features over the, uh, the larger image. But this was one of those moments where a solar event was taking place where sunspots were actually larger than the size of the Earth uh, that were forming on the surface of the sun. Uh, so he was able to uh, capture these uh, with a uh, Lunt solar scope. Um, is this at all similar to the one that the club acquired recently? Yeah, uh, yeah, about 60. Oh, really? Okay. So if this is something that strikes your, your passion, um, uh, Jim and I are preparing to sort of formalize the, uh, the process by which one can borrow equipment from the club and, and uh, take it out under the stars. Uh, and this is now in our, in our library. So, um, you know, obviously there's quite a bit of technique and, and uh, important safeguards to not damage your eyesight. <laughs> using this equipment. But um, again, this is something that uh, as members of the Columbus Astronomical Society, uh, you can explore. And he's got a little GIF here showing some of the, uh, the actual movement uh, detected on the, on the solar surface as he was recording here. Um, so just really special. Um, yep. And then um, uh, Brad has a couple of different images to, to share with us here. I hope I didn't do any violence with my cropping. Uh, no, I think 
think, I think you're good. So I just wanted to uh, introduce my philosophy of uh, astrophotography before I got started. Um, there's a few things you should know about me. Number one, I'm cheap. Number two, I'm lazy. <laughs> and number three, I'm easily distracted. OK, sorry. What? OK. Um, so when I do astrophotography, there's guys down at JGAP that do, you know, images that take two or three nights and they use H alpha and, and, and uh, oxygen sulfur filters and combine them together and, uh, you know, track, do tracking and everything like that. And I am usually down at JGAP talking my mouth off uh, to the people that are down there and I don't have a lot of time to do that. So these images were taken like with me setting up a camera and then just letting it sit there. Um, and so I don't have a lot of attention to these. So these are, these are what you can do without a lot of effort. Um, so this is a, a long-term project that I had um, where I wanted to take an entire sequence of the entire Milky Way, um, at least the part that we could see in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, this is the bottom part of that. So over the summer of 2018, I took uh, 54 individual chunks of the Milky Way in a mosaic. And I didn't always plan things very well, you'll see, because sometimes they're tilted to the side and sometimes they're not. Um, but this goes all the way from the lower part of Scorpius all the way up to beyond Cassiopeia. So that's how, that's how many images there are. Um, and I used a camera just like this one. This is, this is the replacement of that camera. It's a Nikon D750. And I just stuck it on a tripod. I used the same mount that Mark Peter had, which is an iOptron. It was, I got it used for like $200. Remember, I'm cheap. And I took probably about 20 to 25 images. It depended on how many of them showed up. You know, if somebody bumped the tripod or a cloud went by, I, threw, I had to throw images out. And so I took um, between 20 and 25 images, added them up, and then, and then made a section of them, and then did my best in Photoshop to ma make them all match, and then I mosaiced them um, into a large, huge, mosaic of the Milky Way. This is just the bottom portion of it. This is uh, Messier 8, uh, Messier 20, Messier 17, uh, Messier uh, 16, and then 18 is here. This is like the dark horse nebula over here. There's some more stuff over here that was blotted out, but uh, uh, that was in the image, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this is to show you, this is kind of a close-up of the Messier 8 and Messier 20 region to show you how much detail I was actually getting in these images. And I just wanted something that you could zoom into and see all the individual little uh, uh, star clusters and nebula and that sort of thing. And this is just an ordinary DSLR camera taking 20 shots that I added up. And um, the entire sequence is... 60,000 pixels tall from the bottom to the top, the entire Milky Way. And this here is maybe about 15,000 pixels tall. So it's a huge image. And I'm really happy with the, with the result because it looks really pretty. And if I want a good image, I'll just take a little chunk of it sometimes and publish that on the JGAP Instagram page. Yeah, Mark? Uh, what is the size of that file? <laughs> I'm sorry? How big is that file on your computer? How big is the file? Two gigabytes in a JPEG. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge file. Um, so that's, that was a long-term project. And I just did that. I would go to JGAP and set up my camera on a tripod and set up the iOptron and then let it sit and hope that it worked. And if it didn't, then the next time I was at JGAP, I did it again. And it took me the entire uh, 2018 season. So. To do it. Can you get a cup of coffee while you're waiting for it to open? Um, sure, yeah, it takes, uh, it takes a little while. I usually take a shower or, uh, you know, <laughs> or uh, go microwave some ramen noodles or something like that. So. 
Oh, this is, this is actually a bunch of 85 millimeters. So yeah, Mark, um, Mark mentioned the Rokinon lenses, and I just kind of want to re-mention them here. They're, these are really nice lenses. Um, if you're like an ordinary photographer taking pictures of your cat and that kind of thing, they're not great for that because they're manual focus. But because they're manual focus and they don't have any electronics or anything like that in them, they can afford to put all of the quality into the optics rather than the doodads. And so these lenses are really sharp and they work really well for astrophotography because you're not, you're not using autofocus on the sky. You, you're, you're, you're manually focusing it, locking it in, and then just letting it sit. You're not worrying about you know, that bird moving or something like that. So I have a set of three of these. I got the 135, which is the one that Mark used for the comet picture. These were all done with an 85 millimeter lens, which is actually a 1.4. Um, it's not as good optically. It's got a little chromatic aberrations, which I have to take out. You can actually see some of it in, the, in, in some of the pictures um, when you're close up. And then I have a 14. My favorite, I love the 14, and I'll show you the next one. The 14 is a, is a great lens, um, and it gives you a really, really sharp, wide, field of view, and the stars from edge to edge are pinpoint. And I have, this is a full frame camera, so when I take from edge to edge, the, 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 the stars are little pinpoints, and they're, they're pretty awesome. Where do you stop at and shoot wide open? Um, this one was shot with the 85, it's a 1.4, I shot it at 1.8. So I stopped it a little bit down. And sometimes I will stop it down a little bit, but this, this 14, you don't have to. It's perfect. It's fine the way it is. So let me show you one I took with a 14. Um, you may have to click on the little arrow. Click on the little. Can I click on the slide? Let's see. Does that does that work? Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm lazy and I like to do things the easy way. This is another star trail image, and I wanted to kind of demonstrate. Um, the alignment of the astronomy park with our little earth ball and then the top of the flagpole which line up to the north celestial pole. And I didn't use Photoshop to do my stacking. I used a free program, free, because uh, I'm cheap, uh, called Star Stacks. And you can just download it. And basically all it does is make these kind of images. I mean, it, it, it looks for the brighter parts of the image that change and keeps the dimmer parts the same. And so it just adds up, adds up, adds up, adds up, adds up, but it only adds the star part of the image. And it's, it's sophisticated enough to give you a decent, a decent image without too much effort. And it, re it works really well also for something I like to do every June, which is take a lot of firefly shots. I, liked, I didn't include one because I didn't want to talk for two hours. Um, speaking of which, I want to make sure that this is, yeah, still going good, um, since I'm recording. So this is, uh, this is actually really cheap and easy to do, and it works great for, for firefly shots. Um, I took uh, 300 five-second images and added them up. And, and it takes up a lot of hard drive space, but very, very simple and easy to do. And one of the things I like, it you can't see it very well in this, but the colors of the stars come out really nice. They, it's, it actually looks really nice. And you get a lot of interesting activity of the astrophotographers in the foreground. This was taken after a program, and so you see all of the astrophotographers milling about with their red lights, which is kind of cool. Yeah, nice too. Right, yep. Oh yeah, some satellite tracks. Um, these, most of these, this is a satellite track. That's the International Space Station right there. Um, this is, an air, everything else is airplanes, so. Um, but the International Space Station was in it. And that's what, actually why I took it at this time, because this is the ISS. I forgot about that. Right, you have a question. Yes. Do you take the pictures in JPEG or RAW? I take them in RAW, and that's, oh, the, okay. yeah. So that's what, because what I'll do is I'll pre-process them in Lightroom just to, just to get the contrast good and the colors looking nice and everything like that. I don't do a lot, I tend to be a little easy on the processing, but, but uh, then I'll export them as TIFFs and then stack them as, as star stacks as TIFFs. And star stacks takes, I don't know, 
five minutes to stack 300 images, something like that. It doesn't take very long. It's not like Photoshop where you, have, you, know, you can go to Toledo and back and then it'll be done. So, um, now I mentioned that I'm cheap. Um, so JGAP itself has an imaging rig. Um, it's not necessarily mine, but I, you know, basically because I'm the director, I get to use it. Um, this is our imaging rig here. It's a C14 telescope. Um, we have an ASI, a ZWO ASI 1600 mm, for those of you who know what that means. Um, it's just a, not as good as the 2600 and a little better than some of the lower numbered ones. Um, it's a monochrome camera, MM, uh, which means that in order to take color images, you have to use filters. Now, because I'm cheap, I never got around to buying the normal nebular filters like H-alpha or sulfur or oxygen or whatever like that. This image here is LRGB, which is luminance, red, green, and blue. Luminance just basically means that you don't have a filter. You just let the light pass through, and it's a black and white image of all the light. And then RGB is I just choose R and then red and then green and then blue and add them up. And there's not a lot of data in this. I took 90 second exposures on this rig at prime focus. So the, the image itself, the, this, this particular C14 telescope is an F11 telescope, which means that the light is coming in at a very slow trickle. You're not getting a lot of light. And um, so this is about, this is 20 images of each L, R, G, and B, all, and then just added up and then balanced in Photoshop. And uh, this is the bubble nebula. Uh, this is up beyond, you know, in the, up next to Cassiopeia, up there next to M52, and everything like that. And I wanted to point out one little detail in this image. You'll notice that the blue light is not real sharp. And I took all of these images and it took a long time to go through all of them, and I'm talking to people and, you know, distracted, and it takes me a while to change the filter and rush over there and get everything done and everything like that. So I didn't really have time to go back and reshoot these, but I was wondering why in the heck, I was looking at my subs, the subs are the individual images, were not coming out very well in the blue. I was getting a little bit of stars, but they were blurry and everything like that. So I, you know, after everybody went home, I took the telescope off and I wanted to see whether or not the blue filter was clean, you know, because maybe the blue filter had some dust or schmutz on it because it just sits there in the open all day. And I wheeled it open and sitting on the blue filter was a stink bug. <laughs> so I call this the stink bug image. And I did actually get enough blue to have the color balance be correct, and you get the blue star looking blue and everything like that. So even with really bad conditions, sometimes the image can actually turn out pretty good. So that is my, uh, that is my story for the, uh, for the, yeah, the story for the, uh, uh, for my images, so. Um, one quick question for your uh, galactic shot. Yes. So these are stitched together? Those are stitched together in Photoshop. In and Photoshop. actually, I, stitch, I had, because it's such a big file, I had to stitch them together in little bits and pieces. Mm. And I started down in Scorpius Sagittarius early in the summer, kind of around June. And then I, then I went to... Uh, as the season progressed, and you know, Cassiopeia or uh, Aquila and Cygnus, and then Cassiopeia got higher in the sky. You know, in the fall, Cassiopeia is up. I, I worked my way up the Milky Way as it rose through the seasons, and I got a little better at orienting them. <laughs> you know, I I actually kept track of where the last images were when I oriented them, but. Um, but the, uh, but the pictures, uh, yeah, they all added up and I just stitched them together in Photoshop in parts. And then I stitched the parts together after that. So. Is there an automatic way to get the alignment or did you have to hand? There, there, is, a, there is a thing, if, if there's enough data in the image, photo, Photoshop will do a good job. It does take a little while. 
uh, particularly if there's a lot of individual images. But uh, if you keep it to like six or seven images, it can do it within a minute or two. Wow. So. Cool. There are a lot of other photo, uh, astrophoto applications that are easier to use for that purpose. Yeah. More automated maybe than Photoshop to do the... To but then you'd have to buy another program. Then I have to buy another <laughs> so, No, you don't. Nina, for example, will do it and Nina's free. Oh. All right. I'll have to try that. All right. And uh, I think last but not least, Roy. What are the tadpoles? I didn't... I I punched this into Sky Safari and I couldn't find the tadpole galaxy. Yeah, I, I don't think it has an NC number, so it, it has an IC number of me. I don't know what the IC number is. Uh, I, I'm not the one to ask. We have experts over here. Uh, on any given night where there's no clouds and there's no moon, there might be six or eight or ten people at JGO uh, with, with telescopes. So my telescope is, uh, I, I follow Isaac's uh, astrophotography SIG, and he recommends put some money into your mount. So I have a, a, uh, a software BIS mount that is reasonably good. I mistakenly bought a very large so I have an edge 14, uh, and to make it harder, because that's not hard enough, uh, I have a hyperstar for it. So uh, this is a, a, an image I took er, uh, earlier this year, uh, a hyperstar uh, radically reduces the focal length of the, the device. Uh, an edge 14 has a focal length around 3,900 millimeters. And you put, uh, put the hyperstar on it, and now it's in uh, like 700. So it gathers a lot of light, and it gathers a lot of light quickly, uh, which is the advantage of the hyperstar. Um, so with three hours of imaging, I've got really a lot of light for this, uh, this particular object, but of course you can always use more. Uh, this is using narrowband filters. The, ones that have been mentioned, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen alpha, oxygen. Um, I haven't played with those filters too much. This is only my second attempt at trying to uh, come up with a Hubble palette, and I still don't get things right. The, the, I mean, the, the, in Hubble, the, the, this would be uh, a brown gold, and all of this is a, a yellow color. Um, Anyway, uh, everybody seems to have a lot to talk about, about their stuff. They know a lot about the, their, their uh, object. I don't know a lot about my object other than I like it. They're pretty. <laughs> uh, I, I particularly like uh, nebula that have, have uh, dark nebulas within them. And I mean, we, this, this is the tadpole. So we have the two tadpoles up there. But there's this fish in here. Uh, it, it, uh, it just strikes me that there's a, a, a swarm of gas in front of this other object that is unlit and it's so thick that you don't get to see the stars behind it, which, wow, that's stunning because stars are, are incredibly bright. Um, do I have more to say? That's all I have to say. Questions for Royal? So tell us about No, you're not allowed to ask questions. I'm going to ask She probably helped carry that. <laughs> oh yeah, she she helps carry this stuff. Where did you where did you image? Jenga. Uh, uh, you take pictures in Bartle 9. I'm I'm in Bexley, so we're Bartle 8. And I can't take anything. I can take the moon, I can take the planets. We but, have a very small yard, so it's not like you could set up something and have it. Well, the, the yard is the problem. The sky is the problem. The sky is a, mm -hmm. a, a so wash of, of white all the time. Uh, so uh, everything I take is is somewhere else, and mm -hmm. JGAP is a very popular place. It's, it's convenient. Well, 
it could be nice if it's closer, it could be nice if it's darker, but it's it's great. You gotta pick one. Yeah. Closer and <laughs> darker. Yeah. Can you arrange that? I'm working on it. Uh, you had a question. Well, what was it? I was gonna tease you about oh. the evidence. You have a question? I, I had a comment that fish, I think they should call this the Moorish Moorish idol. <laughs> Because that, that fish looks just like a, the shape of a Moorish idol. Okay. Oh, oh, can you actually have it? All right. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. So Roy was down there while I was fumbling around trying to find the uh, electrical uh, juice for my, uh, for my uh, scope. And yeah, uh, there was just... You know, there were kids on blankets staring up at the stars using their original optical devices. Um, you know, there were folks, uh, you know, of all different walks of life wandering around Jay Gap. And, and because he had the biggest telescope and the cool laptop and the picture of a cigar on his uh, laptop, uh, he, he bore the brunt of the, uh, the public outreach, uh, <laughs> the community service. and. Uh, just gave folks a really interesting uh, window into the night sky. So it was, it was a pleasure to eavesdrop until I came over to say hi out of the darkness there. Um, yeah, for the, uh, for, the, for the new folks in the room, um, you know, I think it's really tempting. There's an inner photography in me even that, that just feels like, oh my gosh, I have got to get into astrophotography. I, how could what you see at the eyepiece with your, with your own eyes possibly compare with the grandeur of this. And in some respects, the answer is, of course, it doesn't. But one of the things we've talked about before is this sort of balancing act between just spectacular images that, again, really rival what, uh, or at least kind of a, approach or approximate what space telescopes can produce, or even trying to copy their color palettes, um, versus uh, imagination. The fact that when we just put our eyes to an optical chain, we're having the actual light, the actual photons from millions of light years away have traveled all that distance and, and passing through our retinas. So, um, you know, particularly for folks who are starting out as a, you know, at the very beginning side of amateur myself, um, don't lose sight of just the power of visual astronomy, even for some of the deep sky objects. It, it requires a lot more effort and sort of training your eyes and your brain to see some of these uh, deep sky, some of these that you just can't see, some of them you can kind of see with a filter, um, but uh, there's just a lot to be had in the visual, um, and in some respects I think the simplicity of that uh, is a, just a great place to focus on uh, for beginners. That being said, if you want to get into astrophotography, you are in the right place. Um, First of all, you don't need a telescope or even a fancy camera to be an astrophotographer. Um, some folks uh, in our club actually do sketches uh, using the optical instrument and then um, uh, rendering it through a little hand-eye coordination. Um, so that's certainly another way to, quote, hit record uh, as we look up at the night sky and, and capture something to remember it with. Uh, if you see stuff that you like here, uh, we have an astro camera in the loaner program that can get you started. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles of some of the most spectacular images you've seen here, but it's got all of the fundamentals to sort of help you start thinking through the different trade-offs of, of different equipment and how they all interact. Uh, there's a huge interaction process between all of them. As you've heard, a lot of nomenclature like focal length and uh, the size of the, uh, the field that the uh, camera is actually able to capture and the number of pixels. It does get complicated really fast, but there's a, uh, what is it? It's the Columbus Astronomical Society Imaging SIG, Special Interest Group, right? Um, so um, they meet at a, at a different time of day, often time, a different time of the month, oftentimes here at Perkins as well. And um, they're just a phenomenal uh, group of folks who'd be really excited to work with you if you want to uh, start down this path. Um, so that's all we have tonight. I just want to again thank everybody for, uh, for contributing and for sharing. And uh, man, this was so much fun. I think uh, we got to go out and take some astro pictures this summer and maybe uh, do this again in the fall. So thanks again, everybody. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure.
that real? Are those things have color? You know, because you don't see color through a telescope generally or with right. a naked eye. So what you, is that real color? Is what real color? The images we're showing up here. The images we're showing up here? As I understand it, Orion, you can even get some uh, M42. You can actually get some color uh, with the thing. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I mean, I tell people, uh, so for example, some of these are shot with narrow band filters and they're processed to do certain things. And the ones that are shot with narrow band filters that are processed straight, that you don't do the Hubble palette or whatever, those are real. Mm -hmm. But if you just take your DSLR, which you can convince people, because they, they work great or whatever, yeah. The color comes out. The color comes out. So yeah. you're making up this color, it's there. That's right. But your eye just can't do it because it doesn't have long enough exposure. That's right. So that's when people say, how can that be? I don't see color. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a great point. An SLR can do it. And um, in between a sort of a static where you just have the camera on a tripod not tracking and some of these mega telescope uh, tracking things, um, there are really small trackers that can handle a small, medium-sized SLR really well, and then you can put lenses on them that, you know, I, I think for those getting into astronomy, it's oftentimes we think, oh, we need more magnification because everything's so far away. Some of these nebula are so large, like the North American nebula, you need a pretty wide angle. I would imagine like 135 would probably be... Uh, you know, you don't want to be zoomed in 600,000, 2,000 millimeters uh, for some of these nebula. So, um, and you know, Charles is really good at uh, breathing new life into old cameras and, and can talk to you about the SLR side of things for sure. So lots of different ways to get into it if you want to, but again, don't give up on visual astronomy either because I think that's its own special kind of magic there. Jim, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, well, when you're all finished, yes. Yep. Uh, I'm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, huh? Uh, during the start of the program, we got, uh, I got a little discombobulated there, and I failed to completely to introduce Don, who is the director of Perkins Observatory. So I'm back back there, Don Stevens. And uh, did you have anything you want to say, Don? Or? No, no, it's like okay. There. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I apologize for that. Just we. <laughs> Brad got me going there. <laughs> it was a brain freeze. I'm sorry. A brain freeze. But well, it was more than that. I was playing. I just went for that. Period. So. Uh, Okay, that's it for the evening, and uh, we thank you for coming, and uh, you especially there, uh, I'm waiting to get some solar glasses, some <laughs> solar observing glasses, so uh, have a good one, drive safe.